wish to each a blessed rest in Christ. It is a privilege and an anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you today. It makes no difference whether you have been a Seventh-day Adventist for a few months, a few years, or many decades. The distinct biblical truths upon which God founded this church must be clearly understood. These distinct truths, once understood and experienced by its members, will provide clear evidence to the world will provide clear evidence to the world between truth and error. Amen. Regardless of how arrogant what I've just said may seem to you, it must be true, or else there is no reason for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to exist. Amen. The three distinct truths upon which God founded the Seventh-day Adventist Church are, number one, God's law is binding on all humanity that includes the Seventh-day Sabbath. Number two, the non-immortality of the soul. If the soul were immortal, Christ could not have died. Therefore, his death on the cross cannot be understood, much less appreciated, and its relationship to the Old Testament sacrificial system. Number three, the work of the high priest in cleansing the heavenly sanctuary is directly related as to when Jesus will return. Amen. On these three biblical pillars and landmarks, the Seventh-day Adventist Church stands or falls in the final crisis. I want to take a very careful look with you this morning at these pillars and landmarks. Some of you may say, why at this point in time, Chuck, is it necessary for us to re-examine these well-known biblical truths that some of us have been hearing since we were children? The reason is because there's overwhelming evidence in the scriptures that it is not God's will for us to still be here and for life to continue on this earth as we know it today. Jesus made it very clear to his disciples when they asked him a very specific question. Matthew 24, verse 3. When are you coming back? And he said to them, in Matthew 24, 34, exactly when he wanted to come back. Over a period of 51 years, one of the founders of our church wrote in great detail in five different books that it is not God's will for us to still be here. In one of those books, the heading of the chapter is The Reason for the Delay. We need to be honest and face the truth of our situation. More importantly, we need to ask ourselves individually and as a corporate body, do we have the moral courage to confront biblical truth, or should I say, our present truth? Do we understand that there is a cosmic controversy that demands a solution, and that the solution is not in getting more people interested in heavenly mansions, but in finding people that are willing to stand for right even though the heavens fall. Amen. Christ became our substitute and surety to make it possible for us to be overcomers, no matter what the Christian world says and defines overcoming to be. In order to fulfill our divine calling, we must understand clearly 
the specific mandate that God raised this church to accomplish. The first prerequisite to accomplish this mandate is unity in purpose. And secondly, our message must be biblically accurate. Unity in our beloved church has been receding since the mid-1950s. And without unity, there is no possible way for the Holy Spirit to return and accomplish the work that the Holy Spirit attempted to complete approximately 130 years ago. This disunity has reached the point of a level of stress that even the president of our denomination, Pastor Ted Wilson, addressed when he spoke at the Soquel California camp meeting in the summer of 2014. He spoke three times. And within five minutes of beginning each message, he said, quote, Our doctrines are under attack. End quote. He made it very clear that that attack of our doctrines was coming from within our church. Specifically, our scholars and teachers. In the May 2018 issue of Adventist World for North America, the title of one article was, quote, Church Unity and Biblical Authority, Part 2. Again, the author of this article was the president of the General Conference. The roots of this disunity and theological stress within the Seventh-day Adventist Church can be traced directly to our failure to understand our divine appointment. As Israel failed to understand their divine appointment when God brought them out of Egypt. We're all familiar, uh, us, we're all familiar with how, how God delivered Israel after 430 years of slavery in Egypt out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai. Do we understand, however, why Israel failed to fulfill God's mandate in making all of them a kingdom of priests? Exodus 19, verse 6. Israel's continued failure to understand their divine appointment ended tragically when they rejected God as their leader. When Samuel became an old man, the elders of Israel came to Samuel and said to him, and I quote, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5, Appoint a king to judge us like all the other nations have. In verse 7, verse 6, we learn that Samuel was very displeased with this request and asked God for specific instructions as to how to deal with Samuel saying this evil request. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 7, God says to Samuel, don't take this personally. They're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me in being their king. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 8, I'm going to read it to you word for word. This is God speaking to Samuel. Quote, like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing the same thing to you. End quote. God then said to Samuel, let them have a king. I will read to you word for word why Israel chose Saul as their first king. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of valor, had a son whose name was Saul, a choice and handsome man. There was not a more handsome person than Saul among all the sons of Israel. From his shoulders and up, he was taller than any of the people. That's what they were looking for. Now Israel had an earthly king to visually match the qualifications of other heathen nations and their kings. We all know the tragic consequences that Israel suffered as a result of choosing Saul as their first king. They wanted to imitate 
the ways of the world rather than to fulfill God's mandate for them. The modern roots of disunity and theological stress within our church can be directly traced to the mid-1950s when we developed a great desire and actual concern for acceptance by the biblical scholars in the evangelical churches. We determined to appease their accusation of labeling us a cult. As a result, our frustration in finishing the work is the result of man-made strategies and programs rather than a deep conviction of the unique truths God has given us. If we are to succeed where Israel failed and fulfill God's divine appointment, we must learn how to recognize error and then with a Christ-like spirit repudiate from Scripture the errors being taught today in our schools and from our pulpits. Amen. Amen. And you're welcome to report me to anyone. <laughs> if we are willing, God will bless us in a mighty way in this endeavor. The first major error being taught today is that the righteousness by faith, that righteousness by faith is a judicial act only and it does not include justification. This limited atonement idea can easily be corrected by looking up in your Bible the different meanings of the word justification and righteousness. In the New Testament, there are nine different usages for the word justification and righteousness. Those nine fall into three categories. You're welcome to follow me from Scripture. In Romans 4.25 and in Romans 5.18, a word that appears only twice in all of the New Testament. Paul says in verse 18 of Romans 5, by one act of unrighteousness, condemnation came upon the whole human world. And by one act of righteousness, justification of life came upon the entire human race. The word justification is being used in Romans 5.18 is speaking of acquittal. Jesus has acquitted us from the sin that Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. The second usage of the word righteousness appears for the first time in Matthew 3.15. When Jesus comes to John the Baptist and asks him to baptize him, John the Baptist recoils and says to him, I'm not worthy to carry your sandals, and you're asking me to baptize you? And Jesus says in Matthew 3.15, you and I must do this so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. In Romans 5, 17, the Apostle Paul uses the same word that Jesus used in Matthew 3.15. I'll read it to you. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. If you want to look it up, in a concordance, I think the most popular concordance today is Strong's Analytical Concordance. The word justification that I use in Romans 5.18 is number 1347. I'm really making it easy for you. The word that Jesus used in Matthew 3.15 and that Paul uses in Romans 5.17 is number 1343. So the word that Paul is using in Romans 5.18 is for acquittal. Do you know what that means? It is impossible for any member of the human race to be kept out of heaven because of the bad choice that Adam and Eve made in the garden. It is impossible. Jesus has acquitted us of that. 
Amen. Do you like that? Yes. Amen. The word that Jesus is using in Matthew 3.15, righteousness, is speaking of a new title that Jesus has given the human race. It's called imputed righteousness. The third usage of the word righteousness in the New Testament is found in Romans 8.4. And the number for that one is one, three, four, five. And that is speaking of imparted righteousness, or making us fit for heaven. Romans 8, 4 says very clearly that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who no longer walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. So according to Scripture, Christ has not only acquitted us from the condemnation we inherit from Adam and Eve, He has also reconciled us to God by imputing us with a new title. But that's not all. It gets better. Christ has also given us His, what I call, designated driver. The Holy Spirit which Jesus allowed to drive him when he was here 2,000 years ago for his entire life. This designated driver guarantees to fit each one of us for heaven. That's also known as imparted righteousness. Since there cannot be a wedding without a bride. Let me show you a passage, read to you a passage that you're all familiar with. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. And we have the same usage of the word righteousness here as Paul used in Romans 8, 4. Using the designated driver to experience and prepare us to be fit for heaven. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. Verse 8. And it was given to her, given to her, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. Here we go. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Folks, is that a biblical truth to rejoice about and want to experience in our individual lives? If you believe that the Bible is inspired, this is it. The second major error being taught today is that Christ was born with a sinless human nature like Adam had before Adam sinned. There isn't one scripture in the Bible, Old or, Old or New Testament, that supports that idea. On the contrary, there are many scriptures in the Bible that assure us that Jesus identified with each one of us at the Incarnation so that He could ethically and legally redeem us from the sin condition. Romans 8.3 for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God, standing in some in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. End quote. I like to illustrate that by using my wife as an example. And I want for you to look at my wife right now. Because I'm, I'm going to ask her to do something. I'm going to ask her to take the green hat on top of her head off. Will she be able to do that? Absolutely. Jesus would not have been able to condemn sin in the flesh had He not taken on my sin in the Incarnation. Just like she cannot take that green hat off of the top of her head, Jesus cannot condemn sin if He had not taken off my nature. 
There are many passages in Scripture to support that. Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. Hebrews 4, 15. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Hebrews 4, 15 is an interesting passage. Because Paul is talking about the qualifications of the heavenly high priest. When he says, he had or he took on my weaknesses. The word weakness in the Greek is asthenia. And it can only be used two ways. You're either speaking of physical deformities that Jesus had. Did Jesus have any physical deformities? Was he missing an arm or a leg or an eye? Okay. So the, other, the only other option or definition of the word asthenia, definition, is moral weakness. That's a strong word. Moral weakness is specifically talking about my sinful nature that he took on at the Incarnation. The third major error being taught today is that the events in the high priestly cleansing ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary are not biblically related. If these two events are not biblically related, we then have the most amazing coincidence in all of recorded biblical history, which Daniel 8.14 identifies as the 2300 days or prophetic years. Because the decree of King Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem began in the autumn of 457 BC and formed the starting point for the 2300 year prophecy. You can read it for yourself in Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. From the autumn of 457 BC to the 2300 years termination in the autumn of 1844. Under the Mosaic calendar system, the cleansing of the sanctuary, or the Day of Atonement, you may be more familiar with, occurred on the tenth day of the seventh month of the Jewish month, and it's recorded also in Leviticus 16, 29 through 34. So the tenth day of the seventh month in the Old Testament Jewish calendar system, or the Day of Atonement, corresponds in today's calendar system to the year 1844 and fell specifically on the 22nd of October. The scripture, which above all others, had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Seventh-day Adventist faith, was the declaration, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, end quote, Daniel 8, 14. The direct instructions Moses received to build the sanctuary after the pattern which had been showed him on the mount, Hebrews 8, 5, portrays a divine plan awaiting the complete understanding of God's people now. 